Good morning, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Today's show will be entitled Cannabis is STEM. Our company, Conovation Analytics, has created this initiative out of a need, a need for more African Americans to take their place in the industry, a need for African Americans to have a role in the cannabis space. Conovation Analytics is a vertical business and also consulting agency that focuses on cannabis equity and just general cannabis engagement. Today, we will have a variety of guests on our show that are all focused on cannabis in the STEM careers, as well as in their industry. And so I would like to begin today with our panelists. We have Carlos Ledesma. Carlos, are you here this morning? We're getting them on there now. Hello. Hey, Kinshasa, it sounds like everybody can't hear you. Uh, all the attendees, give us two seconds. I'm going to reset the stage and we'll be on in a couple minutes. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear me now? Can you hear me, Sharon? Yeah, but I think you can hear me now. Sounds good. No so one heard anything that I said, right? Okay. Good morning, I'm Kinshasa Taylor. I am the CEO and founder of Conservation Analytics. We are a vertical business as well as a consulting agency. We originally got into this industry um, by upcycling, recycling bio waste from cannabis. Uh, my business partner cultivated a lot of friends in Humboldt and we started manufacturing and doing a little micro dosing. And so over those six years, we Realized that our friends had worked with African American the African American community alone had no access to the business industry. However, we make up 68 percent of the folks in jail right now for cannabis. And so, we saw this imbalance and thought we needed to do something. So, about four years ago, we started doing um, a homecoming engagement at um, Morehouse College. Um, this past year, we plan to extend to FAMU, Southern, and um, Howard. However, Corona 
got us to the point that we are right now. And so that's why we've created this virtual learning opportunity for you to gain more information about the cannabis industry, to learn more about social equity, and to increase your skill set so that you can enter into a field um, within the cannabis space. And so today um, we have cannabis is STEM folks. So a lot of these folks we have on today are scientists. Um, they're working in that aspect. You can see on our screen today, we have Miss Sharon Martin with Cresco. Good morning, Sharon. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much um, for coming. Thank you to Michael and Cresco for having um, someone that looks like a lot of our viewers today to share that roadmap. And so well, how would you describe your roadmap um, to Cresco or just even to um, having a STEM degree and, and being in that field? Yes, well, I am a graduate of Jackson State University, so um, the I love. I was a chemistry major. I actually started out doing research as a freshman. Um, and from there, I just saw the opportunities um, that research allowed me to do. I was able to go to different conferences, and I went to the conferences. They were all paid for. I didn't have to come out of pocket for anything. I did various internships while in undergrad, um, and it was just a great opportunity. And so after um, I realized like how much I liked being in the lab, I decided to go get a PhD. And so I have a PhD in analytical, analytical chemistry from um, University of Georgia. And just the research I did there kind of set me up for the cannabis industry. Um, I got you know more involved in you know mass spec, which is greatly needed, as well as spectroscopy, uh, which is something that we also use in the cannabis industry. And so from um, undergrad, I worked at the EPA. That's where I really got hands-on training um, on the ma in mass spec. I was a uh, ORI scholar, and so I did um, research around um, you know different um, environmental toxins uh, within the uh, environment. And so from there, it kind of transitioned into um, food science. Uh, it was a time where my family and I were transitioning to the Illinois area and had to find a job. And um, I ended up working in food science. And so there are many similarities to the testing that goes on in the food science world, um, as well as cannabis. And so in this role um, in food science, I became an associate director of operations. So my job was more so uh, managing lab, laboratories, hiring chemists, setting up methods. And, you know, the, um, you know, my boss came and said, hey, we want to get into the cannabis industry and we need your help. And so that's kind of how I kind of jumped into this particular space. Uh, we, it, although I was working in Illinois, we had a laboratory in um, California. So this is right, you know, close to when, um, you know, marijuana had become legal in California. And they wanted me to set, help, help me, they wanted me to help them set up this particular space. And so I was very involved in selecting the analog equipment, choosing the vendors, as well as the different methods. And so that particular experience um, working with, uh, that particular uh, laboratory is what led me to Cresco. And so in my role of Cresco, I am the um, director of analytical chemistry. And so what that means, I really kind of have like three different um, three different roles within the company. And so why lead new initiatives? So if there are new product development that's coming down the line, um, I have to make sure we have analytical methods um, on site to be able to test for that. As we move into new markets, I help set up laboratories in new markets. Like if they ask me for, you know, for the space, um, for design and local space, I work with recommendations as well as hiring chemists. Um, so that's kind of like my track um, into the cannabis world. So it's been great so far. And Chelsea, I think you're muted again. Sorry, I keep keeping myself mute. I'm sorry. I was saying that was great. Um, and I was just saying in college, I, I had majored in biology prior to um, switching over to um, industrial psychology, just because, you know, with science and, and science field, you have to do a lot of memorization and then you have to apply those things that you memorize to different things. Kind of like, you know, when you're in the lab and you're doing tests and stuff and you have your control. So it's interesting to me um, how you were able to take a degree for an industry that didn't even exist and apply it to your knowledge. And so I think that's uh, wonderful. And I um, want to introduce the next guest. I believe we have Shadid Abdul Salam. Is Shadid there? 
I'm still waiting for uh, Shadid and Carlos to come to the backstage. Um, so I guess you guys can continue on and I'll get them going. So when you're when you applied your chemistry um, to the cannabis industry, um, I know that there's a lot of uh, different terminology that applies to cannabis and STEM. And so some of those words are like terpenes and people see that and they're trying to understand what does it mean with the terpene? And they're also trying to understand it. I mean, well, not trying to understand, but have a lack of knowledge of the endocannabinoid system. And I know that's something that medical professionals are not trained on when they are in medical school. And so can you tell us a little bit about the terpene system and its relationship to the endocannabinoids? And I think Jason is on a little later um, and he was on our show the other day. Jason is cultivating. And so he has a different perspective um, of how those terpenes and that endocannabinoid system impacts his career. So how does it come into the work that you're doing at Cresco? Yeah. So um, in my area as um, chemists, we have set up methods to actually analyze terpenes. So, ter so different strains of different um, flower have different terpene profiles. And there are, you know, all kind of websites that people who are interested can go to um, to learn, like, what is this particular strain, what terpenes are found in this particular strain, or what, you know, flavor or, or smell do these particular terpenes invoke. And there's all kind of research, um, in research to get this information. And to be honest, that was something I was really, when I started this journey, that was something I had to learn as well. And so some of the some of the um, places um, that I learned to go to get this information. Of course, you know, I have a you know, PhD in chemistry. So I always start with, you know, journal articles and can I go from there? But I've also learned um, like Leafly, uh, WeMaps uh, and other um, different spaces kind of directed for users. They do have a good wealth of knowledge of like, what, you know, if you're buying a particular strain, what, you know, what is this string invoke or what are the terpenes um, that invoke? And so that's a good place for people who are interested can kind of get that information. You're, you gotta unmute yourself. Sorry guys, I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, when we're discussing terpenes, what do those terpenes do? So I know some of them, like you said, have a, it gives a certain taste. Um, I'm in California, obviously I indulge in California in, Cannabis. So when I go into the store, I read these different things. And so it may say it tastes like lemon, it may say, you know, it makes me sleepy or it says that it relaxes me. And I understand and the differences, you know, between the sativas and the indicas. So how does that relationship between the sativas and the indicas and the terpenes come in? So, I'm, you know, so our viewers can understand a little bit more about what those terpenes do and the role of them when you're analyzing them, them in the lab and when we as customers are engaging, or I guess you could say indulging. You know what, I think that's actually something that's really kind of really been studied. And so I think there's, and this is also like a good opportunity for why we need, you know, this still to continue to grow. Um, you know, I think if you read a lot of different reviews on these websites, they're kind of relying on reviewers of persons um, who've tried the product to say, how did this particular product make me feel? And I think they're still growing, uh, this is a growing field to, really understand, you know, if I do CBD, like a lot of people, some people associate CBD with, oh, I'm, I'm being relaxed or CBN with I'm falling asleep. But, you know, is that really true? Do we have really, you know, really good scientific evidence to kind of prove those things? So I think that's kind of a field that's still growing to be able to associate for sure. You know, uh, limonene, you know, causes this effect or mercine causes this effect. I think that's a field that's still we're still trying to understand that. And I know of uh, different companies are actually trying to map out um, the different terpenes and different strains to associate those with the different effects. Right. Right. Cause I, you know, just from my basic knowledge and, you know, being in the industry, I understand the general aspect, like a sativa is more of a head high. And I understand that when you get into the indicas, it kind of takes your body. So like for someone like myself, it's like, Hey, I work a lot. Sometimes, you know, I may have a little adult ADD. I have twins, so that's I get to push some of that um, out onto them. But, you know, folks understanding how the science of it um, impacts uh, your experience, I think, is relative to us getting voters or just the voting block or just individuals to understand. You know, when we started doing our work in the South, I'm obviously from California, so everything's like wild goose. But in the South, it's like, how do we engage this folks in these conversations in the South? And so I 
noticed that it's been easier for me to explain it from a medical perspective, definitely from a social justice expect, um, perspective, you know, focusing on, hey, we got to get into engagement and things like that. And if there's anything that you think that you could share with um, like a novice, we have a poll up that's just asking, what is your experience with cannabis? So as a beginner, how could you share the benefits of cannabis um, in our communities, um, obviously for social justice, but more so, you know, from a health perspective. Yeah, well, I think um, for me, um, just like my very minimal use of, of this particular product, I've seen that uh, I think our job, I think like the, the focus of this particular panel is for, you know, job opportunities. And I do think like with the social aspect that many, um, you know, you see through many um, different laws for different states, I think that's going to create the opportunity for, um, you know, persons of color to enter into this field. And so I really think this is the opportunity for us to kind of seize on, seize on those um, particular opportunities. So I would say to anyone who's kind of looking um, to enter into this field is to just kind of, uh, it's to kind of, you know, look at different websites for um, particular strains or particular jobs that you would like. Um, you know, I think that even stepping here on this particular panel to kind of learn more information about cannabis and about STEM is um, going to be beneficial. And so uh, as far as the health links, you know, I'm really not, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not a, a doctor professional, so I don't want to, you know, misspeak on the potential benefits of cannabis. And so I'll just leave that, you know, leave that to maybe um, somebody, we have, you know, the professionals who may be able to speak on it. That's something I would want to do because I wouldn't want to, you know, cause confusion or, you know, give out misinformation for just based on my own experiences. You're, uh, you're on mute. I'm so sorry. I just, uh, I keep forgetting about my mute being on. Um, I was just saying, um, asking you, what are some of those majors um, that someone could get into from a STEM field? And prior to that, I was just saying um, that I think for next week's show, well, not think, next week's show, session three will be entitled... Um, cannabis and science. And so we'll be talking to a pharmacist, uh, we'll be talking to a nurse, and we'll be talking to a couple of doctors. And so they, they can go into that more. I think I was just more so just, you know, kind of like a, just a general statement, you know, like understanding when I'm in this house, I'm talking to older people. I have a lot of older women that love my products because it's a simple way for them to relieve their pain or whatever it is. And I think what I wanted to articulate have you articulated is why cannabis is beneficial for um, someone who's looking at it from a medical perspective? Because your actions as a chemist impacts the medical doctor's ability to prescribe. So you're like kind of the first step, you know? So I think uh, I think it's beneficial. Just some we're still I think we're still learning about some of the different health benefits of cannabis. Um, I still think that this is something that's still maybe um, being investigated. And so I think that people are still finding interesting ways to use um, to use this product. So I still think there's like a lot of more needs to be done to truly try to understand like, you know, the benefit of what persons are receiving as far as their, their perceived benefit or how this particular thing makes them feel. But to hop on your question about um, different careers or majors, so like, uh, you know, chemists, of course, microbiologists, um, you know, plants, you know, that's a really big field. Microbiology is important for, um, you know, plants, uh, different products that may come from um, cannabis as well as food. That's a, a really big field. We uh, do hire, we have microbiologists on, on our staff. It's what people in food science, like I said, um, you know, people are looking for ways to put cannabis in food products. Uh, and so learning, you know, learning, knowing that those different techniques is something that's always beneficial. And botanists, people who work, you know, plant, plant, you know, plant biologists or botanists, uh, that's always um, a great field for them as well, because, you know, you need to know how to, you know, plants, you know, plants need different things to grow. And there are like a lot of different effects like pH or the nutrients that plants are receiving the water or sunlight. And so many things that kind of go into cultivation that, you know, you might think is uh, just putting in a pot and grow. No, there's more, much more to it. And, um, you know, how to increase your yields on the potency or how to increase your flavors with the terpenes or how to, you know, how to 
um, how to uh, cross, uh, what's it called? How to uh, breed, breed different plants. You know, those can maybe create new strains. So there's like a wealth of opportunity for people who are interested in cannabis, I mean, STEM especially. Okay, cool. Thank you, Sharon. I see we've been joined by Shadid, and you were just saying botany and other things. And Shadid is our ethnobotany specialist. Shadid Abdul Salam is a wonderful person that I work with, and he can tell you a little bit more about what he's doing at Morehouse. Um, Shadid and I and Messina, who you all will meet on the show on August 11th, we're working to try to bring some of those educational opportunities to schools like Morehouse, schools like FAM. Um, one of the things we've noticed with uh, this trend of cultivation or just cannabis licensing is that there are historically black colleges that receive cultivation license, and there's predominantly white institutions that also receive these licenses. But there is a big divide in the amount of resources that are inputted into those schools. So you have a school like LSU who's cultivating manufacturing, and they also have educational opportunities within their program. And so we see schools like Southern where they have manufacturing and they have cultivation, but there's no access for students in the bio department or in the ethnobotany department to engage. So Shadi, tell us a little bit about your roadmap to where you are and what you're doing over at Morehouse. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. First of all, thank you. And I apologize for the delay. I was actually uh, had to log in via Chrome, which was was interesting. But I, I was able to listen to both of you all from the intro all the way to some of Sharon's insights. And um, prior to me introducing myself, I, I want to just go ahead and, and touch on a couple things that I thought were, were really special that you all both, both brought to the table. One is uh, Sharon spoke about her research experience from her freshman year at Jackson State. Um, I know having a pathway is, is really the most beneficial thing. I started my research experiences at Morehouse my freshman year of college as well, after my freshman year through the McNair Scholars Program. And so a lot of those programs between that and Mark and other uh, U-Star, these different programs that provide research platforms for students who, you know, initially by pathway, I was looking to do MD, PhD. Um, and so, you know, you go in pre-med and you say, okay, I'm gonna do MD, PhD. I, I like research, but I wanna be able to have a clinical application of it. And um, I had, had research experience. My first research experience was at CDC. So being here in, in Atlanta, it was, a, it was a great opportunity to actually train underneath some, some of the uh, stalwarts in, in analytical chemistry, um, some old school uh, chemists, um, Dr. James Granger, uh, some of these individuals who are at CDC and who are some of the first African-American chemists um, in, in the country. Um, and, we're, and we're very strong in Nobuche and different organizations. Um, I actually was a biology major, and then I minored in chemistry. Um, and, and, you know, at a school like Morehouse, it's very small from a departmental standpoint. The only thing that you have to pretty much not take as a bio major to be a chemistry major would be a PCHEM, which is a, a full year. And so the PCHEM course is a full full year course. And uh, then, of course, there's, there's inorganic. There's a secondary inorganic chemistry. But outside of that, you know, what I find, and I know Kinshasa and I spoke on, on, on several occasions, uh, while I was at CDC, I actually I worked as an analytical chemist. And so um, while working as an analytical chemist, I would actually intentionally go and seek out students like Sharon to be a part of the ORISE program that she spoke about, that she was in at EPA. Um, and this is just a, an opportunity for people to come in and look at a real world application of how science can be utilized in, in hands on setting. So as as we as we spoke, uh, my experience went from CDC to now I'm actually I'm back at Morehouse and uh, and I'm working in the Division of Sciences and around ethnobotany, greenhouse. Uh, we have some analytical instrumentation that we're looking to introduce the students to. Um, LC mass spec and uh, hopefully some GC mass spec. And we would love to be able to seek some guidance um, so that we can provide these opportunities for these students to realize in this upcoming industry of cannabis, cannabinoids, hemp, that people are going to be needed on the side of regulation, regulatory, what that means in FDA, uh, USDA, um, CDC. You're also going to need people in pharma in uh, application from a medical and clinical side, as well as private companies like Cresco that are looking to push the edge, the cutting edge of research around, you know, uh, 
purity, testing, and all those things play such a major role, as Sharon said. You go from, from growing a plant to understanding the chemistry of it to being able to analyze it. So we're excited, and I'm, I'm just happy that you're able to, uh, you know, we're able to continue this work. Thank you, Shadid. I'm on mute on. Um, Shadid, can you talk to um, everyone a little bit more about what ethnobotany is? Um, I think once I uh, hooked up with you last year, came into the greenhouse and I understood that or just thought about the fact that there's more medicinal plants besides um, cannabis. And I started thinking about aloe vera, simple things like that, and then the catnip. And so can you share with everyone what um, ethnobotany is and how we're tying that all in over at Morehouse? Absolutely. So, you know, as a, as a researcher and as a scientist, you know, we look at uh, the universe was our first university, right? So before we had any of these different institutions, you know, we would go out and engage in the natural landscape and be able to see how they would benefit. Um, you know, we all look up to, to Dr. George Washington Carver down at the esteemed Tuskegee Institute because what he was able to do was engage in the nature and then extract out items that can help benefit humanity. So ethnobotany in particular is studying botanicals or plant compounds coming from specific regions in the world that have medicinal properties. Um, as Sharon knows, being right there in Chicago, um, I used to live there as a kid. You've got a school down on the south side called Percy Julian. Um, so I lived right around Percy Julian. Percy Julian was one of the first African-American chemists, and he was responsible for extracting plant botanicals in order to come up with an ACE inhibitor or high blood pressure medicine, right? So when you're looking at a lot of these things that, you know, uh, individuals who are PharmD or pharma pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, these different components that allow medicinals to interact in the body and improve it, a lot of those things come from, come from nature, right? So it's all about how you extract it. And I'm sure Sharon, being an analytical chemist, when you study different things like toxicology, like when I was at Emory, you realize that, for one, the dose is in the poison. But then also you realize that depending upon how you process a thing also determines how it can be used. So you look at something like uh, castor oil that uh, I'm sure Kinshasa and Sharon has had, have had before as, as kids. Right. Castor oil is, is used for medicinal purposes. Right. But the castor bean itself. If you rub the castor bean together, it is actually to a toxin, a serious toxin. Um, you know, so, you know, these are some things that you have to know how things are processed. You have to, you know, a lot of times we might not have, and, and I say we, in general, people who are not educated to the fact that processing plays a major role in the way chemicals are released. They think that, hey, let me just do this with that, right? You know, you have people who say, well, let me just put bleach on this ringworm or put bleach on this corona, right? <laughs> so, you know, the reality is, is that you cannot, certain ways, if you process them in a the body, can be poisonous. Certain ways, if you extract it and do it in a different way, can be a healing in medicine. So, you know, the castor bean and castor oil is, is the prime example. Uh, one is called ricin, <laughs> which nobody wants to be a part of. And the other one is, is castor oil, which is utilized, you know, safely by people for hundreds of years. So I think that the important piece is, like you said, with ethnobotany is being able to identify plant compounds that have medicinal uh, usages. And, and we're finding this out every single day. Um, there's things that we deal with every single day. And, um, you know, seeing how we can use that to, to best uh, help benefit humanity. Thank you. One of the things um, that I thought about when I developed this initiative was the fact that we have these 3% of colleges and universities, historical black colleges and universities, and they produce 90% of our black judges, 70% of our black ju uh, doctors. And, you know, now we're kind of seeing with this George Floyd movement, we have a lot of kids that are starting to do go to black colleges for sports, you know, keeping that money in the community. And even now with you all, you know, being African-American and in this space, just that right there alone has a great impact. What do you think that are things that we can do to ensure um, that HBCUs are engaged, to ensure that our community members are engaged and even our seniors, you know, getting them engaged? Because I look at my dad and I am just took over, like taking all of his medicine and he has all these pills and like, I would love to give them cannabis, but then I don't know how it complicates with some of the other things. But just tell me, like, 
how can we um, as African-American influencers in this space have a greater impact on our colleges, communities, and persons? I would just like to say for me, just looking at the path I took, I think um, opportunities, you know, maybe some of the different companies provide internships. Um, the, you know, the internship experience I received when I was, you know, a junior and senior uh, going into, uh, you know, I went to Washington from Mississippi, went to Washington State, you know, for the first time, I uh, did an internship with the FBI. And just those experiences themselves um, provide a great opportunity. So I think we've been able to leverage, um, you know, you, you, in these universities, we have, we have minority students. We have minority students who are brilliant and bright and they want these opportunities. So, you know, look for ways to set up um, partnerships. I know a lot of HBCUs do have partnerships. You know, some have partnerships to medical schools, some have partnerships to, you know, pharmacy schools. But, you know, how can we look at these different companies and establish partnerships, you know, to the cannabis, cannabis industry? I think that's, uh, for me, as someone in the sciences, there's like a, a way to go is to kind of look at it, go at it from that standpoint. Uh, Sharon, that, Sharon, that was like music to my ears, right? You know, I think that, that that's what we need. We need partnerships. And, and a lot of times at HBCUs, we tend to get overlooked in a sense because we're not looked at as tier one research institutions. But as Kinshasa spoke, we're producing the majority of those contributing in the field of study. Um, I think that resources should be invested, especially on the undergraduate level, so that we can expose our students to practical applied science, um, like the work you're doing, or um, and then be able to connect them in. You know, um, I would I would reach back to uh, Professor Wallace Sharif at Morehouse and Lance Shipman. And, and other individuals while I was at CDC to tell them, hey, listen, I'm recruiting for O-Rise. I need some guys to apply. Um, and so I think being able to have resources first on the undergraduate level so that these students can make sure schooling is paid for um, or they can have some paid internships so that their stresses can be relieved. But then also uh, being able to tie them into those research experiences that you spoke of. Because even within those research experiences, if, if you don't have exposure to certain aspects from your undergraduate, um, you end up coming in a little bit behind. Um, but really the the sweet spot and the, and the treasure and the, the pool of talent is at these institutions, these HBCUs. And so we look forward to seeing what we can do at, at Morehouse and in the Atlanta University Center at Clark Atlanta and other different HBCUs as well to see how we can enhance that and amplify that. You know, I, I have a, a, a unique stance where I went straight up into the Fed and did research there for years and now being able to come back into the institution, um, which you know I hadn't been since I left, um, to try to help amplify a lot of this talent and a lot of these skills that we have to help advance industry. So um, I, I echo what you say. So we look forward to getting you know heavy investment, you know, in places like you know Morehouse, you know, places like the, you know in, in Clark Atlanta and places like Jackson State um, or private. We don't get a lot of funds. We're looking to amplify those things. So we greatly yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, when we, and I thank both of you all, um, in thinking about this whole pipeline, you know, you just kind of think of the beginning of the hose where the water comes in. And so for us, that's our K through 12 partners like Calvin Mackey that's doing STEM. Calvin got a van. He just took himself to the middle of New Orleans, Ninth Ward and said, hey, I'm going to have some technology back here. And so we value partners like that. And then we get to, I guess you could say, uh, to the college career phase. And so that's where partnerships like with Cresco, Caliva, Leave, some of our sponsors come in because we need you all to have these opportunities available. We need you to have these internships available. And so, you know, I think that um, one of the things that I would love, you know, to come out of this is for there to be a bridge. You know, I, I consider myself kind of in the middle between grassroots and definitely not like a corporate person. But our goal with all of the things that we're doing is to kind of create that bridge and share opportunities for some of our folks. Uh, we're and so, um, again, I thank you all for being here. I think Kevin is going to take a quick today. commercial and break today really we're quickly and we'll be with, back. We're going to do this every week. It's going to be a quick so, segment just to familiarize uh, people who may not know of a HBCU that they didn't attend or they haven't thought about. But first, of course, we're going to start with the AUC, the Atlanta University Center of Higher Education consists of four schools, Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse College, Spelman College, and Morehouse School of Medicine. 
The picture you see is the Atlanta, um, is the Woodruff Library, also known as Club Woodruff. It's the library and resource center that the school share. So we wanted to start with the AUC because as Kinshasa mentioned a few minutes ago, we did a summit there. It was the third year we did it. This was at Morehouse in the Leadership Center. It was an all day summit where we talked about social equity. We talked about business strategies. We talked about, we had politicians there talking about the pros and cons of going from decriminalization to recreational use. And we had um, doctors there who also talked about um, the benefits and the different aspects of CBD and cannabis products. So let's start off with Clark. Clark University, Clark Atlanta University has 4,000 co-ed students and they're based in Atlanta and they're considered the oldest um, HBCU in the South. Um, Atlanta University was founded in 1865 and they merged with Clark College um, in 1988. So they're the oldest. Um, Atlanta University is a graduate school. It was created so that Morehouse, Spelman, and Clark students could have access to research facilities. Since back in 1929, when the AUC um, Center was created, we weren't able to access the research and graduate research and training from predominantly white institutions. So Atlanta University, which was a predominantly research institution, for graduate students, uh, we created that partnership for the AUC, and that's how that came about. One of Clark's strongest aspects is the, their arts and communications programming. A lot of famous people in the arts, mass media, reporters, uh, TV personalities have come from Clark Atlanta University. Uh, Spike Lee took most of his performing arts, theater, and um, movie theater classes at Clark Atlanta University. Just mentioning some of the other famous alumni, James Weldon Johnson, who did who wrote "Lift Every Voice and Sing," uh, Kenya Barris, who did "Blackish" and "Grownish," and also uh, hashtag Black AF, and uh, Amy Sherrod, who was the first African American woman to paint the First Lady uh, after Michelle Obama invited her to do that privilege. Spelman College. Spelman College is considered one of the top HBCUs and really top colleges in the country. It was founded in 1881, um, and it focuses definitely on women of African descent. Spelman, since this is the theme uh, STEM for today, uh, produces the largest number of black women in the STEM fields of science, engineering, and math for both undergraduate and advanced and PhD degrees. Has a little over 2,000 black women there, and their motto is all about service to the community. Some of the famous alumni, um, superstar executive Rosalind Brewer, who is currently the seat, uh, chief operating officer for Starbucks International. Before that, she was CEO of Sam's Club. Alice Walker, Pulitzer Prize winner, is an alum. Marion Wright Elderman, the founder of the Children's Defense Fund. And Stacey Abrams, who a uh, politician, lawyer, and voting rights activist, uh, is also Spelman alum. Now we have Morehouse. Dear old Morehouse, Morehouse is considered uh, one of the top schools, not even, not only for HBCUs, but in the world. Um, Morehouse is located in Atlanta, Georgia, with about 2,200 schools. Our motto, I did attend Morehouse, I did Kevin and a couple other people on the line, is as facta ad lux, meaning, and there was light. Morehouse some of the famous people who've gone to Morehouse, civil rights icon Martin Luther King, Spike Lee, uh, musician P.J. Morton, and Eddie Glaude. And, you know, um, Morehouse alum, there's one, a famous quote I really like that by Benjamin E. Mays, who was Morehouse, who was Martin Luther King's mentor. He said, you know, if you can't get into Morehouse, it's okay to go to Harvard. Then the fourth school in the AUC is the Morehouse School of Medicine. The Morehouse School of Medicine actually was started from a medical education program at Morehouse. Um, it's now one of the leading, it is the leading uh, medical institution for dealing with social mission and health equity. They recently were awarded a $40 million grant to fight COVID in underserved communities, uh, both um, urban communities and rural communities. 
and um, it's something well deserved because they're an amazing school. The leadership for Morehouse um, was started by Lewis Sullivan, who's also the secretary, ran the secretary, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and David Satcher, who was also a Surgeon General and the only four-star admiral to be a Surgeon General. And it's currently run by um, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, who's a renowned obstetrician, also serves as the chair of the American Medical Association GYN uh, board. Uh, she's the current president. So just wanted to do a quick spotlight on four schools, four HBCU schools. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Thank you very much. Thank you, Erin. We appreciate you. I'm going to go back to Sharon and Shadid. We have a couple of questions. Um, one question for you, well, so multiple questions, Sharon. Um, there's a couple of folks that are saying, um, does Cresco have any opportunities in Atlanta? And then they wanted to know, what is the age requirement for positions um, at the cannabis company? Yeah, so I think it's pretty common that most positions um, require to start at 21. Um, maybe I can um, um, fact check, but you know, that's like the base requirements we require for some of our chemists to be um, in the facility. And yeah, and so I always check the Cresco website. Uh, we, we do uh, have, do not have any current opportunities in Atlanta. But if you check out our, our website, um, we'll have our, there'll be a list of um, different opportunities uh, for you all to check out. Yes. And just a note for all of our viewers today, um, our title sponsor, Cresco, as well as our additional champion sponsors, True Leave and Kaliva, all are working to create opportunities for you all. So on our HBCUCEI.com website in the upcoming weeks, we will have opportunities from a variety of companies that you all will have access to. And so again, that's one of our priorities here is to filter you all through that pipeline into internships to also filter you into careers. Um, and so uh, let me check the next question. Well, actually I have another question for you. Someone just text me, Sharon, really quickly. Um, what are just some? What are some of the new developments in the cannabis cannabis industry that Cresco is working on now? Uh, we have quite a few um, uh, new products coming out. Um, I would say, um, I'm trying to see the best way to answer. We have you know new products coming out. We're always trying to um, stay in touch with what we think our consumers want. Uh, you know, we may have. Uh, trying to think, trying to, I would just say we have we have a variety of new, uh, new products coming out. Um, like the best way to learn what we have coming out is our website. We also have a really good social media page on our Instagram page. Um, it's always a good place to kind of see the new and various products that we have. Yes. And coming to the market. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, and if you all want to learn more about our speakers, you can also go to our participants page on the HBCUCI.com website. There's links to all of our participants, companies. And so we just wanted to directly connect you. Um, thank you, Sharon. Shadid, I have a question from a student and they want to know what's going on in the AUC and are there any schools that are looking to start offering these courses in the AUC? That's a great question. <laughs> so um, I'm glad this is a, a more simple question than the one the complicated one Sharon got talking about the uh, a pipeline. <laughs> so uh, we are, we're actually uh, in the process uh, about, so we're in 2020. So in 2019 um, at Morehouse, myself and uh, Dr. Musina Morris, who is, uh, she's the academic uh, program director for chemistry. Um, we started a research project and our research project was uh, analyzing plant-based oils using analytical chemistry. And our whole goal was to give students some background uh, in order to prepare titration curves, in order to utilize analytical instrumentation um, and whatnot, right? So I'm coming from a, you know, that background in the government. But also, we have the only operating greenhouse in the Atlanta University Center. So therefore, we make sure that we make that accessible to the students at Clark Atlanta University, Morehouse, Spelman, uh, and even Morris Brown, now that it's it's coming online as well as Morehouse School of Medicine. So 
we are continuing that work. Actually, we had a seminar course as well um, that was offered by uh, Dr. Morris. Uh, and right now, Dr. Morris and myself, we have actual student mentors that I was uh, on, on the phone earlier in a, a conference earlier, going through an abstract with regards to cannabinoids and, and, and impact from a public health standpoint um, and being able to give students other entrances through this space. I've had many students come to me on campus if they see me in the greenhouse and they say, hey, we wanna be cultivators, right? That's normally, that's the first entrance right now. This is a hot industry, you know? So people wanna know, okay, listen, they might be a psychology major, a physiology, a kinesiology major. We wanna be cultivators. Um, you know, they wanna go where uh, the industry is budding and developing, which is, is a wonderful thing. So what we've been doing is now inviting students from every single department to learn some principles of botany. So we're giving them the opportunity to come through the greenhouse with me, hands-on, um, and giving them opportunities to grow, looking at different modalities of growth. Different modalities of growth have different yields. Learning, like Dr. Martin said, uh, pH and how critical that is, water, sunlight, other areas that have an impact on the extraction, whether you extract it through which alcohol in particular or um, whether or not you're analyzing it. Uh, all of these different pieces, the whole purpose was to let the students know that cultivator is just one aspect. People are gonna be needed from a policy standpoint, from a business standpoint, from psychology standpoint, understanding what are some of the impacts uh, of psychological usage in treating mental health based upon the different terpenes or different cannabinoid types. Um, so all the way down to the physics and engineering, right? So I worked in tobacco <laughs> at CDC. And so when it comes down to engineering, what people don't think about when you're dealing with products um, like the product lines that we're talking about with, with Cresco and Trulieve and Caliva um, and delivering cannabis, what we're talking about is a delivery device has to be utilized. So which delivery device yields the most efficacious impact. So we're talking physics majors, right? Um, you know, so uh, then all, all the way down to ethics and policy and legal. So each aspect, we wanna make sure that people understand that the work that we're doing weaves throughout each major. And so as a researcher coming from that, that space, you realize very early that you have to engage multiple aspects um, of, of academic study. So um, we have some projects going on and we're gonna continue some projects uh, at Morehouse and in the AUC and, and we're looking to kind of ramp them up and we're gonna be announcing them relatively soon. And hopefully we can do that as well from our virtual platform. I know Kinshasa is working with us as well as Cresco and, and uh, Cresco as well. So we're excited. Please stay plugged into us and um, we'll, we'll open up opportunities for you as well. And just to extend off what Shadid is saying, if you ever get an opportunity, definitely go on our website, click on the different companies, Cresco, Caliva, um, for the different shows. You'll see that everyone in the cannabis space does not have a STEM degree or nor do they need it. They have a need for accountants, like Shadid was saying. They need for folks to do development like Michael. Hopefully you guys will meet her. She's a wonderful person from Cresco, but Michael helps develop some of the programs and she also um, engages folks. And so when you're thinking about cannabis, just think of it as like a kind of like Target when you think about Target. So I guess you could say the folks at the counter and the folks that are uh, behind the pharmacy counter, those are folks like Sharon. And then you have someone in the background making sure that payroll is done and you have managers. And so I don't want you to just feel like, hey, I only have to, I can only get into this space via STEM. We need folks that are like myself that are working on social equity, you know, and so just keep that in mind, you know, that variety. And so um, another portion of our show today um, will include um, just giving you all some tips about business development and career tips about getting you there. And like I said, this is an entire pipeline. So I want to thank Sharon today for coming on. I know your partner, uh, Jason, will be on in a little bit. We have um, Jason coming on talking a little bit more about some STEM and specifically from Cresco. And thank you, Shadid. Um, I'll see you on the call tomorrow with Jason. Um, and, you know, as we continue to push things forward, I thank you all so much for your time. Sharon, your information is in here. Is it okay if we share it? 
if students want to engage with you? Yeah, that should be fine. No problem. Okay, cool, cool. So we'll get that information out to you guys. Thank you so much, Shadid and Sharon. You guys have a great day. You can sit back and watch the rest of the show. And um, thank you again. We appreciate you so much. Thank you, Kinshasa. Thank you, Sharon. Thank All you. right, thank you. Five seconds. Be sure to mute your mics. by Salida and Chantel Mitchell of S. Mitchell Career Development and Services. It looks like it's because we're all cousins, and I just realized that when they got on, that we all really look alike right now. So take it from here, give them some great career tips, and let's see how it goes. Thank you. Hi, um, so my name is Chantel Mitchell. And I'm Salida Mitchell. 
And we are the founders of S. Mitchell Career Development Services, and we're so excited to be a part of the HBCU um, Cannabis Equity Initiative. Yes, thank you for having us, everybody. So next slide. Um, I'll start by telling you a little bit about our company. So SMDCS, what we do is we provide tools and strategies to prepare clients to be successful in the work in the job market, and we specialize in three things. First, career coaching and consultation. We also build resumes and cover letters. And then lastly, we help to identify future employers. So um, a little bit about ourselves. Um, we are sisters and um, I graduated, I'm Chantel. I graduated from Cal State LA with a bachelor's degree Business administration with a concentration in HR management. I have over eight years experience in that. I've worked in several different industries such as healthcare, retail, and right now I'm currently in education. I'm an HR coordinator for UC Berkeley. And the reason we to develop the to create this company is because I noticed as I started to progress my career. As I started to move up the ladder, I noticed that there wasn't very many people of color, specifically black people in more managerial roles. And um, I'm I, and I wanted to do something more to help, um, you know, get more people of color in uh, management positions. All right. And as Chantel mentioned, we are sisters. And so we actually have been working since we were 16. Like many of you, we were the first people in our family to go to college. And so when we talk to students who are currently in college or aspiring to go to HBCUs, um, this is why we exist. And so a little bit about me. I um, have been in education for the past 10 years. And when we talk about STEM, I started my education journey as a teacher, a middle school math and science teacher, um, teaching predominantly in South LA and then also here in Richmond, California. Um, and there's a lack, there's a void of um, students who are excelling in STEM. And so I believe that this um, equity initiative is gonna really um, open up some pathways. And so um, after I was a teacher, I stepped into the admin role. I've been a dean. I've been a coach. I've been a vice principal and a principal. And um, thinking about college, thinking about access, um, and really providing that mentorship piece is really key in thinking about the progression um, of our African-American, specifically students. And so we really want to be able to provide these resources. We want people to be able to take their skills and to be able to market them. And we know that the cannabis industry is something that is huge, and we want to be able to tap into that. And today we are going to be sharing a few tips. Um, so really quick, we just wanted to let you know that um, S. Mitchell Career Development Services, we aim to establish a clear pipeline for people of color in the workplace. We provide affordable, judgment-free guidance and tools to enhance our clients' skill set, mindset, and give them the, a competitive edge. We want our clients to feel comfortable and confident to go after their dreams while positively impacting the world. All right. And so we've broken down our products and services into seven distinct steps. And throughout the series of this webinar, we plan to drop some tidbits and give you guys some information on each. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit the planning and goal setting stages. But if you can see the seven that are there and if you tune in in weeks to come, we will be talking about resumes cover letters, the actual application process, preparing for interviews, and then also the retention. So I'm going to hand it back over to Chantel to talk a little bit about the planning and goal setting and some things that you should keep in mind. Yes. So when preparing for a new career, here are some questions to consider. First, what are your current experiences? And that doesn't necessarily mean what is your job title. Um, look into what your skill set is. What are you doing in that job? Um, Number two, what are your strengths? What are you good at? What are some things that your teammates would say about you? Like, are you a good trainer? Things like that. Number three, what do you enjoy doing? What, are, what gets you excited? What are you passionate about? What type of industry? Would it be education, healthcare? And then number four, what are some transferable skills, things that you can utilize through many different industries? Um, customer service is a good one. If you're a cashier, then you can, you know, uh, interact with different people in several different industries. 
All right. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you for all of the other participants that are here. We plan to join on the remaining sessions and we're going to dive a little bit more, whether you are looking to tap into a career for cannabis or if it's something that you're in, we provide services to continue to help develop yourself. And as um, you know, people of color, we really have to take that time to invest in ourselves and our careers. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you guys. And like they said, every week they'll be providing you all with these tips that we hope will help push you along this pipeline into the cannabis industry. And next we have a speaker that you all were able to meet last week, um, Jason Nelson, and he's going to give you some more tips and information about cannabis as STEM. Thank you, Jason, for joining us. I love that shirt today, too. You have two shirts now that you have to send me. <laughs> Fix it up, right? Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Kachasen. Thanks to all the other presenters. It was, it was good to see Sharon as well. It's I'll be working the same company, but with the corporate office closed, um, we have to do a guest lecture to be able to see each other. So thank you again for having me. Um, I know today we kind of had some discussions about certainly terpenes, a little bit of the endo endocannabinoid system, and then likewise STEM as a, as a whole. And so I'll just take a few, few quick minutes and kind of go over some details from my perspective. Uh, I was very lucky to have a scientific-based training structure before I really had the passion and interest in cannabis. I had an undergrad in agronomy, which is field crops. And then on top of that, I did a, a master's in horticulture, both at Kansas State University, which uh, I still tout as it is one of the top five port schools, ag schools in the country, albeit they're still very averse to cannabis over there. Um, so um, a, a quick bit of information, just a, a fun little scientific conversation. So um, beginning with terpenes, um, you know, uh, Kinshasa, you had some great questions for sharing on what terpenes are. So if I take a step back uh, and kind of understand terpenes and likewise cannabinoids. So these uh, these beautiful green plants behind us, the ones that uh, occur in nature, I think everybody's fairly familiar that those plants are undergoing photosynthesis. And so photosynthesis is a, a brilliant process of taking sunlight carbon dioxide, and the plant turns that into sugar. Um, now, uh, that's a primary metabolite. So it's making sugar and higher level organisms like myself certainly appreciate that because I need to get my energy from the sun in some form or fashion. Obviously not being solar generated myself, I'm gonna either rely on a plant to turn it into sugar for me, or if a, a higher level mammal such as a cow or a pig happens to eat that plant, then I'm going to take in that protein, assimilate it to my system, ergo, getting the sun, uh, sun's energy available for my consumption in the form of sugar. So that's a primary metabolite, that's photosynthesis. Plants also create secondary metabolites. So secondary metabolites don't have anything to do with photosynthesis, they're not driving the, the primary metabolism, um, but secondary metabolites do have a purpose for the plant and thankfully for us, they actually have benefits for us. The secondary metabolites that we're interested in, certainly the cannabinoids uh, and like we've been talking about terpenes. So both of those compounds fall into a secondary metabolite um, category. Um, plants make secondary metabolites more so for uh, UV protection. For those of you that know that cannabinoids, essentially the trichome heads are very sticky, that would act as an anti-pest feeding mechanism. So there is some benefit for the plants to make um, these cannabinoids and or terpenes. And we obviously know that there is benefit for us when we consume these secondary metabolites. So specifically to terpenes is where we were going. Um, terpenes are made by the cannabis plant, but they're also made by other plants um, in the same species and, and outside of that species. So um, if you can smell a plant, um, whether it's a rose, a mango, uh, certainly cannabis in this space, or hops, um, that's a terpene. Essentially, it's a volatile chemical that's leading the plant structure. It enters your nose and it lets you smell whatever that particular plant smells like. Oranges is a great example. Um, what those terpenes also do, is specifically in cannabis, is generate an entourage effect. So that, as, as Sharon was discussing, essentially, Kinshasa as well, um, cannabis can either be generally an uplifting experience or a relaxing experience in two big categories. Both of those big categories of cannabis flowers have THC in them typically. What makes one uplifting and the other relaxing is the terpenes that make that flower smell like it smells. So that's the entourage effect um, that terpenes bring to the table that Kintasa was discussing a little bit earlier. So now that we understand what those compounds look like in the cannabis plant, let's talk about the endocannabinoid system that uh, we have inside our internal operating mechanisms that um, have a benefit from those secondary, those cannabinoids and terpenes, let's say. So the way, and I'm, I hopefully I can generate some questions for you guys for the medical experts next week because I certainly know enough to be dangerous, but my understanding of the endocannabinoid system is that it's a system of receptors within our body that controls homeostasis. And so my understanding of homeostasis is your body's abilities for all these intricate systems, uh, your nervous system, pulmonary, respiratory, 
for those to be able to communicate and balance this entire system, um, it requires a communication pathway, which is the endocannabinoid system. So what it does is it keeps all those systems generally working in a proper form and function, even if you're stressed or if you're injured or, or some of the things that can happen to you as a human organism. What we're finding is that um, in the endocannabinoid system, there are cannabinoid receptors that actually respond to cannabinoids that you ingest and or terpenes you ingest, as well as your own endocannabinoids. And so why we believe there's actually some medical or have seen medical benefit from cannabis consumption is the ability for that endocannabinoid system to better regulate homeostasis. And there's you know, obviously cannabis research has been very difficult, certainly in America, other, other countries are, are starting to take the lead on medical research. But a good example is a reports by diabetics. So someone who's a diabetic, if they're consuming even small dosages of cannabis, um, it's not going to cure their diabetes. But what it actually seems to help is with their insulin efficacy. So that they were used to using a specific insulin dosage before trying cannabis. Once they tried cannabis, they were actually able to reduce their insulin input because the insulin they were taking in was more efficiently used. Their homeostasis was improved. And again, these big anecdotal uh, um, claims um, were all excited about the future of STEM, certainly medical science, horticultural, biotechnology science, which we'll talk a little bit about here to close this discussion, to really help us truly understand what's going on there. But um, for a long time, we all kind of understood cannabis as certainly having relaxative properties, as social use properties, stress abatement, those types of things. But there could well be a whole host of um, endocannabinoid related benefits that simply consuming either a low dose THC cannabis, high CBD cannabis, not necessarily intoxicating, but um, getting that true medical benefit um, for people who are willing to accept it as a supplement to either their daily use or, or a medical style use. So let's then move into STEM and biotechnology. Um, as we talked about, those plant compounds, the cannabinoids and the terpenes, those can actually be biosynthesized or synthesized in a lab. And actually, um, Sharon is not uh, unfamiliar with the types of terpenes that we have purchased in the past to be able to do research and development. Uh, my camera's turned off. Let's see. I can sure see myself. Um, let's just try it. If I react to it, does that help? I, like I said, I can see myself yammering away here. And that would be screen share, which we don't want to do. Um, I've got a green light, so I'm, I'm hoping everybody can see me. But um, and like I said, I can see myself. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, and so uh, ultimately, you can biosynthesize or synthesize these either cannabinoids or terpenes. Terpenes are a lot more commonly synthesized because they're not as regulated as something like THC is. So right now, as a company, we can buy uh, synthesized terpenes. They're literally the same chemical constituent that you would find in the plant. And let's say if I have a, a plant cultivar that smells like lemons, it has limonene in it. If I open a jar of limonene that was synthesized, it smells like lemons. Um, and so what that starts to indicate then is that you may actually, or one may actually be able to cocktail or compound, either making a cannabinoid, taking a terpene, and, and having a specific product outcome, um, which is actually starting to be done. It's very commonly done um, in markets where electronic cigarettes are made from distillate. Um, and so they'll make a distillate, which is all THC. It's a, a very flavorless oil. They'll add in some terpenes to be able to kind of mimic the natural flavor associated with cannabis. Um, for those who have had uh, terpene-laden um, cartridges or, or e-cigarettes, they have a flavor, they're acceptable, but they certainly don't uh, trend towards the actual plant cannabis flavors uh, compared to something like a live resin product, which is locking in all the natural plant oils, extracting them, and making sure that those are retained in that final electronic cigarette. And so what I hope to essentially uh, indicate is, uh, for STEM particularly, there's going to be these whole sets of disciplines that come into play with respect to biotechnology. A common question I get frequently asked is, uh, do our can is cannabis GMO right now? Are there genetically modified organisms uh, being uh, produced in the cannabis industry? Uh, the answer, short answer is no. In, in the American cannabis industry in the United States, we certainly don't have any of that leeway to be able to work through biotechnological advances with uh, genetically modified cannabis uh, certainly people in their basement can use that CRISPRs technology and do a little bit of gene editing. It's, it's kind of a random um, circumstance, but that is occurring. I, I doubt very much of that has made it into the uh, regulated cannabis circumstance. It certainly hasn't for Crespo. So um, common laboratory procedures like an agrobacterium transformation of taking a powdery mildew resistant gene that we find in hemp, using a little bacteria to inject that in, into a uh, cannabis cultivar that we want to be powdery mildew resistant. 
that's all completely open for innovation in space. Um, and a lot of the universities who are doing this type of work in, say, rice or other type of commodities, obviously fear losing their federal funding and do not touch cannabis research as a result. Um, and so ultimately then, uh, the innovation ultimately to reduce my type of, of job security with being a cultivator horticulturalist, say yes, that we can manufacture this entire product, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the specific uh, ratios, and do it with consistency in a laboratory has a lot of potential upside. What we're finding is that it's difficult, is that mother nature has put a lot more compounds inside those flowers that are ultimately extracted as far as, as part of a, a true extract product. So it's, it's difficult, uh, is the moral of the story, to be able to have a product that is uh, as effective as either a, a whole plant consumption event or something like a whole plant extract in, a, in an ethanol rick's in soil um, versus a live resin. So I would hope with this yammering, and I'm sorry if you guys couldn't see uh, my face there throughout the whole uh, affair, but um, and, and definitely have some time for questions if you guys have any. But um, just a quick primer there, obviously, of what uh, certainly a STEM applications look like uh, with respect to uh, cannabis, both on the cultivation production and now the, the future of biotechnology associated with it. Thank you. I'm looking for questions now. If anyone has any questions for Jason, please leave them in the event chat box or the stage chat box so that I can ask them. I'm looking right now, just checking. Them. Well, someone has a question and you may or may not be able to answer it, but she's trying to understand more about the science behind cooking with cannabis. And mm -hmm. I know a little bit, um, but um, I did major in biology. Chemistry was like my favorite class. And so with that background, I was able to learn how to microdose and extract and decarboxylize. And so I don't know if you can give Paello, I don't want to mess up your last name, but Paello, she had a question about that cooking with cannabis. Sure, absolutely. So great question. Um, and yeah, I, I know enough to be dangerous. I work very close with our edibles team. And so you're right. The first question is, what are you going to use to dose in cannabinoids to that final edible product? And so um, you can obviously use the plant. Um, the problem with the plant itself is that if you ever try to eat a cannabis plant, all the chlorophyll and the plant parts in the cells are very, um, they taste bad. <laughs> they're, they're, if, if you've had some weed brownies, essentially, that just had ground up cannabis in them, um, they don't taste very good. And so a lot of times we recommend going with something like a concentrate, which can be like a keef, which is ground fine cannabis trichome glands, or if you're able to extract your own oils or buy an oil, something like a Rick Simpson oil, and use that to dose into your edibles, what you'll have then is a higher potency oil with a lower flavor uh, alteration. One mm -hmm. of the key things, and just a quick note to what you mentioned there, if you are going to use the raw flour, you have to decarboxylate it or heat it because that raw flour contains THCA. And if you just try to eat that, you'll get some THCA into you, but um, the actual impact, the, uh, the medical efficacy of cannabis is when it's turned from THCA into THC. That happens under a heating process. That's why you bake pot brownies, going through the baking process, um, activates the THC so that when you ingest it, um, you can you know, have the experience that you're looking for. Um, so that's essentially it then. Once you have either your activated plant material or your oil, then you can dose it into a, and there are online, there's online dosing calculators that are very useful for, if you want a five milligram piece at this many grams of, of weight, then it gives you a very straightforward calculation on how you can dose your own edibles that way. Yeah, and if and if and if I could suggest, I use stems and leaves because, like I said, I got into this by taking someone's trash. They were throwing it all away three, four years ago, and so I decar decarboxylize those stems and leaves. And one of the things that I did prior to like actually making my products, I make simple syrup, I make olive oil, coconut oil, um, I make bath products, pretty much everything. I did my math first. So like Jason said, there are calculators out there, your percentage, or I guess you could say I utilize the strand name. So I usually use Indica's just because I want to have that impact with all of my um, products. And so you can see the strand name, you can see the percentage of THC and kind of use that as a gauge. And I usually use stuff more than 20%, but that's because I have five cups and I only use about a tablespoon of my solution, whether it's um, oil or um, sugar water, you know, that kind of thing. So I would definitely say look for the, one of those calculators um, and do research on the products that you're using. And then that's what you use to input. Okay, I'm checking to see. There's another person that has a question around the stigma. 
And so how can there be some type of movement, I guess she's saying, around this stigma in the cannabis industry and manufacturing products? Um, I know from my experience here in California, I can get anything that I want, a honey stick, a cookie, a brownie, um, cereal. I can get cereal with it, anything. But I guess the stigma exists in other states and other um, areas as a result of, do you think it's a lack of education, Jason? You know, like in Atlanta and in, um, I think in Arkansas, flour is illegal. And so, and even in Louisiana. So there's not too many edibles or I guess you could say different entry points for folks to ingest or consume it. And so where would you say that stigma comes from? Sure. And when I, even back to my experience, um, I was a dare kid, you know, uh, like a lot of us were. And we yeah. understood that, you know, in first grade, you were, you were talked about cannabis and uh, opiates and, and meth and everything in the same conversation. And I know our parents were as well in general. Um, you know, that, that misinformation campaign picked up really heavily around the 40s, 50s and 60s. So that's part of it. Um, the other part is that I think my experience, say, uh, working through Denver, first in California, now coming to Illinois, Coming to Illinois was kind of that experience where uh, it, you couldn't really comfortably talk about cannabis all the time. And I think one of the reasons why is that one, the disinformation and the drug war was so effective, especially in the Midwest and the South. Um, but two, those folks just haven't happened to have either a cancer survivor or a grandmother or someone who had benefit from some type of cannabis product because they weren't even in the markets. You know, even in Denver right now, if somebody was really struggling or say 10 years ago, five years ago, they could go get some cannabis and actually just see if it helped. Um, and so my best experience has been people coming to me and saying, hey, I was not a supporter of this at all. I had my worries, but, um, you know, you gave my grandma some quality of life back for her final six months. Um, and so I, I think that's big. And for you, you uh, markets in the South, you guys are right in that circumstance right now. It hasn't been an easily uh, accessible type of certainly regulated product, not a full product suite for someone who might be comfortable with flour. It's not even an option to purchase in dispensary. So time does help, but it's an, it's a, everyone's personal choice of how they kind of react to the stigma that's surrounding them because it is still evident in certain parts of the country. Yeah. And then I have another question from DeAndre Smith. He wants to know, Jason, what are the, some, some of the positions in the cannabis industry that you believe will be the next big thing? Hmm. Um, so next big thing, uh, biotechnology, kind of like we talked about. So lab assisted uh, type product manufacture, um, research, all that stuff's got a lot of promise. Um, I don't, I'm dangerous in the IT world, but something like blockchain security and that type of technology right now that um, IT and security is very much in its infancy um, with respect to uh, its iterations in cannabis. There's state level guidelines that you have to adhere to, but as far as operators or companies, third party uh, providers who can help satisfy those IT and security requirements are gonna need more and more skilled programmers, uh, IT technicians, all those types of things. Um, and, and really then outside of that, uh, there's just gonna be a whole host of uh, retail innovation with delivery. You know, there's certain uh, in-home deliveries available in some markets right now, but not most. That's gonna be big when that chip kind of falls that the brick and mortar, isn't similar to how Amazon's treated a lot of the brick and mortar establishments that um, cannabis is very easy to order at home. You don't have to worry about walking into a dispensary and trying to figure out what maybe one you want or have a bunch of conversations with a butt tender. Instead, you can go through um, even online ordering, let alone home delivery. So that'll be a big area for innovation coming in the next two to five years in cannabis from my perspective anyway. Yeah. And I'll just say being here in California, going through COVID, we just got relocked down here in Berkeley because of everyone at the beach in Los Angeles. They have 72% of our cases. And what we noticed is that dispensaries were not the thing. And when I got into this space and I started looking into social equity programs, specifically here in, in the Bay Area, Oakland, a lot of the equity license that they were given out were for delivery because I think it was looked at as an industry that wasn't really important. And now with Corona, e-commerce, delivery, transportation, that is more critical than having a brick and mortar store. And it's probably more feasible to just have um, the delivery. And I think it also creates opportunities. Um, I know Ease, I just spoke with someone at Ease the other day, and one of the big issues they had is they never got a license to deliver. They were kind of like the middleman. And one of the ways that they were able to provide a solution was to create partnerships. Um, so it's like, I have a friend, she has a delivery equity license, and she just partnered with different companies so that she could sell their products for them. So I would definitely say, you know, in addition to the cannabis and STEM careers we're discussing, as well as the business, and I guess you could say some of the accounting and other professions, or I'll call them for lack of a better term, kind of ancillary profes professions, there's also opportunities for you all to look at cannabis 
as an entrepreneur of how you can get into it. Um, I have a friend. I made some oils for her and now she uses them. She's a, a masseuse. So now she uses the oils there. So there's so many ways that we can apply cannabis to our lives. There's so many ways we can apply cannabis as a career. And, you know, I just think that um, it's great to be able to interact with folks like you all. And it's great to ask a lot of converse, um, excuse me, a lot of questions. And so that's what we're here for. Um, I want to thank Jason again for being on. I want to thank Sharon and Shadid. Jason, you're like super duper informative. You have the best shirts. Um, <laughs> I'll see your address in the chat box. So I can get my shirt. So I'll just call Michael. But mm -hmm. um, thank you. You're like very informative. Um, I think you talked a little bit more last week about how you transitioned into tobacco, into cannabis. And just think of this industry as something that you can transition into. I guarantee you. Everyone that works there doesn't consume. So they weren't smokers and said, oh, my God, now I can get a job and, you know, and have my social interactions as well. I think that um, a lot of folks that are entering is it's exciting and it's new. And who wouldn't want to be a part of something that's exciting and new? So I want to thank you all again, um, all of our viewers. We want to see you next week. I have placed the link for um, session three. It'll be entitled Cannabis as Science. And we'll discuss those truths and falses in cannabis um, with different medical professionals. Like I said, we have um, some HBCU grads that'll be on the show that are nurses and doctors, and they'll be here to share some of that other, I guess you could say an extension of what you were discussing with the endocannabinoid system, you know, how it impacts um, folks in the medical profession when they're prescribing. We'll also have a pharmacist on there and he'll share a little bit about his experience with it. So again, thank you all so much for coming. Um, if you have any questions, I think um, you can email us, um, go straight to our website, hbcucei.com. I want to thank Kevin Ford, um, our partner with Uplift Maryland, for helping us out today. And we all look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you so much. And oh, sorry. And thank you, Celine and Chantel. <laughs>